Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the sanctuary. Here we go. Say hello, good morning. from Chile. Oh, that's awesome. Good morning, family. Thank you, Manuel. Happy 
As you guys are finding your seat, uh, we just want to open with a word of prayer, and uh, I want to welcome some guests we have here today. We have missionaries from San Miguel. We have Ben and Susie Argis, and so they're going to come up and speak um, after we get done with the worship and just give us an update on how things are going, and uh, so we are really glad to have them here today, and let's just go to the Lord in, in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for the rain that you've given us. We thank you for this blessed day you've given us. We thank you for the ability to worship you freely. We thank you for a building to do that in and people to do it with. We are so grateful for your love. We thank you that your word says where two or more are gathered, you are here. So we invite you and we welcome you. And we ask that you would just take this time of worship as just our offering back, just a small portion of what you've given us, that we give it back to you. We ask you to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Yes. Great are you, Lord.
night, everybody. This is a newer one in me and my family's lives. I know it's been around for a while, but it hits home when you have nowhere else to turn in the dark times. John, thanks for leading us in worship. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm going to have Ben and Susie come up right now, and they're just going to spend a little bit of time giving us an update on how things are going on in San Miguel. So without further ado, Ben, Susie, come on up. Yes, give it. 
Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> As he usually did on the weekends, he would go out with his friends and get drunk. He met this lady. Lady was not from Mexico City, was from another town. It happened to be a town in the county of San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Her name was Elvira. They met, Elvira uh, fell in love with Luis. They got married. She started going to a Bible, Bible class in a home. It was more like a, like a home church kind of thing. She became a believer, invited her husband, Louis, to come and meet Jesus as well. Louis came and received the message gladly, and his life was changed drastically. Then he decided that he was going to be a, an instrument of God in his hands. The first thing that he committed to God to do is to go to the village where Elvira was from to preach the gospel. So he ended up in El Fraile about 10 years ago, and he started going every weekend to the house where his wife's family is living. Well, Elvira's mother, who happens to be Elvira Sr., she also became a believer, and then her husband. And eight years ago, her, their son, Alberto, who lives in Fort Worth, Texas, became a believer in Fort Worth. He is an illegal immigrant who happened to come and enjoy the life in the United States. And one of you believers shared the gospel with him. He became a Christian. And he started sending money to his mother, Elvira, in El Fraile to build a chapel. For eight years, they were building this small building, probably half the size of this building right here, so, so that someday somebody would come and have worship services there. That was eight years ago. Two years ago, Eliezer who happens to be a believer of six years back, he decided that he was going to drive through a new road to go back to his house. And he found this chapel. The chapel was amazingly built. It looked like a little church, a country church. So he stopped and asked questions about the chapel. And the older brother of Alberto, Beto, 
He said, well, this is a Christian church. And Eliezer said, well, how many people come to this church? Because I've never seen this church before. And he said, well, it, it's three of us, my mom, my sister, and I. And, I, and he, then Eliezer said, well, can I come too? Sure, you can come. So he, Eliezer went, he joined the, the small group of three believers in that building. And Eliezer said, can we start a church? And the mother said, well, you have to talk to my son. The son, Beto, got in contact with Eliezer. Many people have asked for this building to start a church, but Beto just didn't feel in his heart that it was the right time. But when Eliezer contacted Beto, uh, Beto said, you are the man. God revealed to me that you are the man. Eliezer immediately contacted us. We at the time had finished working with another village, Alonso Yanez is the name of the village, and we finished working with that village, and we were asking God to lead us to the right place to start another church. When I received this call from Eliezer, and he said, Brother Ben, I need you. I need you to help us start a new church in this new village. So right away, my wife and I went, visited. That's been two years ago now. And now we have a church of about 40 people, and this new church is called Jesus Christ, the way to heaven. So it is amazing to see how God is working in the villages of San Miguel de Allende. However, this is one of 900 villages, and there's only witness in about 10% of those villages. So you can imagine 810 more villages that don't know the message of Jesus Christ. There is a big job ahead of us. Matthew chapter 10, actually Matthew chapter 9, gives us a story almost towards 10, chapter 10, gives a story towards the end of the chapter. It says a phrase that stuck with me uh, all throughout my call to missions, it says, Jesus had compassion. Jesus had compassion. Now, let me tell you about that word. That word in Greek is splasma. Now, in Mexico, the word plasma, it's the, they call it the vitality of the blood. Okay? Imagine that in Jesus' blood, it was running this urge to see people coming to know him. That is what it really meant. If Jesus had this compassion in his blood, it was running all the time. I need to reach people for myself. I believe God is calling us to do the same thing. His compassion was shown in our lives. In our blood is Jesus' blood running so that we can become one of his family. He adopted us to be his. But he also, at the same time that he adopted us, he wants to recruit us to have the same compassion for people. And I realize that some of us are the belayers, those that hold on to the rope. And some of us are the ones hanging from the rope. Susie and I are hanging from the rope, and we depend on you. Please, please, don't let go that rope. If you let go, we fall. We are here to thank you. Thank Sanctuary, because I know some of you are praying for us daily. Some of you are giving for us to stay there. Some of you are sacrificing even to go. And we thank you very much for being part of our mission. Your partnership, your partnership means a lot to us every day, every second. And we thank you so much for that. Pastor, thank you. I appreciate you very much. Um, let me just pray for you and Susie right now, if you don't mind. No, we don't. Join, me in, join me in prayer, everyone. Lord, we just thank you for Ben and Susie. We thank you for the story of Lewis mm -hmm. and the legacy that he's now getting to see and just to see how you were at work many years ago in Ben's life while he was preaching here 
and then in the lives of many people in Fort Worth and San Miguel and all over, you orchestrate, you move, you are in control. And so, Lord, we trust you. We trust you with everything we have. So, Lord, we entrust Ben and Susie and their mission and their work to you, and we ask that you would support them. You ask, we ask that you would help us as we try to support them the best we know how. So I pray your blessing upon them, and I pray your blessing upon the sanctuary and those who give and pray and sacrifice. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you amen. So You're welcome. Thank you. Here's the microphone for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, so um, one thing that I was asked to do, uh, Susie was not on the mic, so for those that are listening online, I want to just reiterate what she said. There are some cards in the back. Uh, not that that's for people online, unless you're going to get in your cars and drive down right now. Uh, but there's a QR code on that, and if you want to get more information, and if you want to sign up for their email or their mission stories, um, I'm assuming they can do that by going to Bria Life also? Yeah, they can do that. Yeah. Okay, and so for those of you listening online, Bria Life is the ministry name, and you can look that up, and you can sign up to get updates on what's going on and how things are going, and if you want to donate or give to their cause and be a belay person to help them belay on, that would be amazing too. So uh, we uh, are so fortunate to uh, be able to give and see what's going on. Uh, another couple that is serving with them is Wes and Amy Ely, and they have been here also to help us know what's going on with uh, things going on in San Miguel. And so we are praying for all of them that are serving the Lord diligently there, and we appreciate you guys very much. So today... I'm going to continue our series uh, that we started last week, and it's a series called Hostage, and that sounds horrible, right? But we're talking about breaking free from those things that keep us hostage uh, in our lives. And so last week, we started it off by talking about the idea of bitterness and how bitterness can keep you hostage and keep you from experiencing the fullness of your life. But the antidote of that is forgiveness. And so we talked about that if you are uh, being an unforgiven person, you don't forgive others. It's like eating the rat poisoning and expecting the rat to die. It doesn't work that way. Forgiveness is not for the people you are forgiving. Forgiveness is for you. It's so that you can receive all that God has for you in your life. And it frees you. It helps you to break free from the bondage of bitterness uh, and so that was what we talked about last week. And today we're going to tackle that thing that keeps us hostage, which is worry. I don't know about you guys, but I worry a lot, right? Uh, I know we're not supposed to worry. I try not to worry, but it's hard, right? Um, the word worry, it actually is derived from a German word, which is worgen, uh, or vergen, however you want to say it, which uh, it means to choke or to strangle. So worry really just chokes the life out of you. It'll strangle what is good in your life out. That's what worry will do. And so we don't want to be strangled. We don't want to be held hostage by worry. And so we wonder, why do we worry so much? Well, I worry about my finances. You probably do too. I worry about getting my kids through college. I worry about braces. I worry about the cars and are they going to continue to run? Is it time to buy a new car? I wonder, uh, I worry about protecting my children from the evils of this world. I worry about them driving. I worry about them dating. I worry about them. I worry about them. I worry about them, if you feel me on that one. And then there's taking care of our parents and worrying about that and how that's going to go and how do we deal with those situations or Maybe some of you, um, a loved one is coming up on a doctor's appointment or a hospital visit or a surgery, and you worry about the results and how that's going to go. Sometimes there isn't much to worry about, so we get worried about that. Because that's just the way that we are kind of conditioned in today's world. We're a 24-hour news cycle, and they always want to tell us about the doom and gloom. So if the weather's good, you're worried about the next storm that's coming. If the storm is coming, you're worried about how bad the storm is going to be. Uh, you just seem to, we live in a culture where worry seems to be 
a thing that is dealt with. And so if you've ever felt held hostage by the sin of worry, I hope I can bring you some scriptures and bring the scriptures to life. And I want to tell you a story that maybe kind of helps you with seeing how the, the, the scriptures that we're going to read will, will kind of help you understand them a little bit better. And just to give you a little bit of context, um, I, I, I do not like snakes. I, I think it's safe to say I hate snakes. Um, I am not a fan of snakes. When I was a teenager, I was mowing some grass and I was told... Uh, as we started doing it, that, oh, by the way, there's a lot of coral snake out here. I did not wear hiking boots, so my Achilles was exposed, and he's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. If they start to chew on it, you'll feel it. Just grab it and chunk it. <laughs> sure enough, eventually I felt something gnawing at my Achilles. I grabbed something slimy. I chunked it. I went and I sat on the tractor. I said, you're doing it the rest of the day by yourself. I'm done. You can dock my pay. You can do whatever, but I'm not getting out in the weeds again. And pretty much ever since then, I have had a hatred for snakes. I will identify if they're poisonous when they're in at least three parts. That's when I will do it. Um, shovels are my friend, and when I could see, a shotgun was my friend. But um, snakes are not. So I wanted to give you that context, and I came across a story from another pastor who shares my lack of love for snakes. And so one day, uh, he was uh, at home, and he was in charge. You know how it is when dads are in charge. He has three young children, and his two-year-old was out on the front porch, and he heard his little boy so excited, and he was squealing with joy, saying, My friend, my friend, Daddy, I have a friend. And they lived out in the country, so there wasn't like a lot of kids that would come by. So, uh, you know, and by the way, if you have a two-year-old, friend means friend. Um, and let me translate for you there. And so this dad said, Son, uh, where is your friend? Is it an imaginary friend? And his son pointed and said, no, he's my friend. And he pointed down to a small rattlesnake. Uh, and of course, he freaked out and said, the dad said, that is not our friend. And um, anyhow, he, he squished the head and grabbed a shovel that was not too far by and did what I would do and cut it in half, smushed the head. And, and I would have probably reacted very similarly of course, the little two-year-old was quite distraught that he ruined his friend. But I tell you, and I share this story, because a lot of people think that worry is their friend. And worry is not their friend. We need to be educated, just like that little two-year-old needs to be educated to have some disdain for that, to have some concern for that. Not to worry about it, <laughs> but to understand the power that that snake had. And we have to understand the power that worry can have in our lives if we allow ourselves to be held hostage. So we almost always hold on to worry. It's kind of strange, isn't it? That we just hold on to it. And so those of you who are Christians, you might not say that you worry, you may say, well, I'm just a little concerned, right? We, we like to put a different word on it. I'm concerned about something. I'm not worrying about it. Um, so, you know, you're trying to make it sound good. But the truth is, is that we are worried and we do hold on to it. And it's almost like we think we have to. Because if we don't hold on to it, then something else might come along that's even worse. And something worse would happen. And so we've got to learn to recognize that we never will be set free from worry if we're always holding on to it. And so here's what I think you need to understand. It's almost like we are giving the enemy a little bit of control in that situation. Because we are expecting the worst. And it's a tool that Satan uses, the evil one uses in our lives. And he tries to destroy our faith. And he tries to teach us and train us to actually hold on to worry. Because if you think about it, the opposite of worry is faith. Romans 14, 23 says this, Everything that does not come from faith is sin. So if worry is the opposite of faith, then we know that worrying is a sin. So worry is it's like 
saying, I believe in the worst case scenario. It's faith in the bad things rather than faith in God. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, you know, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, something bad's coming. Like they have a faith that bad's coming. I can feel it. Instead of having faith that God is with us and God is in control. So let's define what is worry. Here's my definition, the working definition I'm going to use today for worry is worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. I'm going to read that again. Worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. In fact, here's what Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1, 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So let's look at what Jesus said about it. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, here's what he said. He said, Do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, is life, is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? So, Jesus said, do not worry about your sukha. That would be the word, sukha. When he says, do not worry about your life. The word there is sukkah, and in the Greek, that word is translated as life. But it's more than what we really have. The, the English language does not fully grasp the Greek very well. And so let me just kind of expound upon this and say it really means what would be called the whole life or the total life. And so if you translate that, it means your whole life. It means your mental life, your physical life, your emotional life, your spiritual life. It means your yesterday life. It means your today life. It means your future life. It's all encompassing. Do not worry about your sukkah. In other words, nothing. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about those things. So, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about your sukkah, your life. And he goes on to say, because, so here's the reason he gives us, your heavenly father, he loves you and he's got your back. That's my translation. Jesus has got you. God has got you covered. And yet so many of us, even as believers, what do we do? We stay awake at night, playing the game of what if going over the different scenarios over and over in our mind, agonizing in fear and tension. Our stomach gets all knotted up. We get ulcers. We get headaches. We get our neck all bent up out of joint. Our back is sore and tight. We get high blood pressure. We're just stressed out. Sometimes we seek drugs. Sometimes we seek other things to try to help us do work through this, but we are, in a sense, held hostage by the sin of worry. In all aspects of our life, your mental, your physical, and your spiritual. And Jesus is telling us, no, no, don't worry about your sukkah. Give it up to him. So, I'm going to give you uh, three statements that I feel will help us as we want to stop the stranglehold or overcome the stranglehold of worry in our lives. So three statements that I want you to walk away with today. And the first one is this, and this is a statement you can make and you can declare out loud or you can declare at home or you can write it on your mirror or whatever you want to do and you can say it every morning. And here's what the first statement is. I will do what God asked me to do. See, sometimes as Christians, uh, we over-spiritualize things. We think, well, God is going to provide. So I'll just pray about it, and God will just take care of it all. He is the Santa Claus in the sky. He's got it all taken care of, and I am good. I just pray and ask God to take care of it. But here's the bottom line. If you need a job, praying about it is a good thing, but you might want to 
update your resume. You might want to go on Indeed.com. You might want to go on LinkedIn. You might want to go knock on a few doors. You might want to open up the newspaper. You might want to see what jobs are available. So yes, start with prayer, but you've got to do something about it, right? You can't just pray and sit and wait sometimes. So we say, well, have you applied for any jobs? And you say, nope, God is going to provide, right? That's sometimes how we over-spiritualize it. Or maybe I just want to feel better. Well, have you been to the doctor? Have you been eating right? Have you been exercising? Nope, God will provide, right? We just over-spiritualize things. And maybe God is saying, get off your duff and go run. Or maybe he's saying, you know, put down the cheeseburger and pick up some broccoli. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he's saying filet mignon every day for the rest of my life. I don't know. I don't know. So God will ask you to do something. So let's see what James says. He says this. James says, <laughs> he says in James 1, 122, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so be deceived, but do what it says. Don't just listen, but do it. So, you know, there's sometimes when I was growing up as a teenager, I heard my mom saying something, and it went in one ear and it went out the other, but I didn't get up off my duff and go do it. And my dad had to give me a little bit of incentive, if you know what I mean. Sometimes that would happen. And so I think what James, James if, you, if you ever need some incentive, read the book of James. Just, just saying. James is, he holds no punches. He's the dad kind of thing. He brings the belt and lets you know what's going on. And so that's what he's saying is, guys, don't just listen to it. Do it. You have to do what it says. And so that's, that's James's perspective. And here, here's two things that I think God will always tell us to do. So you may go, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, let me just give you a couple things that I know he's always going to tell you to do. He's going to tell you, think on the right things. Think on on the right things. The scripture tells us to take our thoughts captive. So take captive the wrong thoughts, the wrong ideas in your mind. So when you get woken up in the middle of the night because you're worried about this, take that thought captive. That is not healthy for you, right? And so when you say, well, I don't understand. What do you mean by take? I mean, pray out loud. Say, Satan, you have no ground in my life. And in Jesus' name, I ask you to leave me alone. Don't tempt me with this sin of worry anymore. And God, I turn this over to you. <laughs> to you. It's really that simple. So the Bible tells us not only to take that thought captive, but to replace it with the right thoughts, to meditate, to think about, to dwell on things that are pleasing to the Lord. So those things that are negative and bad, Take those thoughts captive in the name of Jesus. Replace that with what is pleasing and healthy and good in your life. That is one thing that we always know. that he's, God's going to say, think on the right things. So, when the devil says to you, you can't do it, you'll never amount to, you'll never be able to, dot, 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 whatever that is, you replace that thought with, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, period. Not by my own strength, but by God's. Notice that just as Jesus was tempted in the desert, what did he answer Satan with? The word. The word of God. So, I can do all things. Now, the second thing that I know that is going to happen when you say, what do I need to do? The second thing I know you always need to do is do what is wise. Do what is wise. So, we should always seek God in prayer but while, when we're seeking God in prayer, we should also seek wisdom in ways that God has given us. One of the ways God has given us wisdom is through his word. We can't combat things with his word if we don't seek his word, seek wisdom from his word. The other thing is God puts wise people in your path. Solomon, one of the great, you know, most wise people ever, he says, walk with the wise and you will be wise. Translate that, walk with a bunch of dummies fill in the blank, right? So God is saying, if you want to know what to do, pray, read his words, surround yourself with godly and wise people, and listen. Listen to the word, and then do it. So if you want to know two things to do, that's two things that I know we are always 
asked to do. So once you get wisdom from, from talking to God and listening to the word and seeking godly and wise counsel, then you have to do what is wise. So first thing you're going to do to overcome the stranglehold of worry is, first of all, you will do what God ask you to do. So if you want to get up in the morning and say, God, I will do what you ask me to do today. And just ask him to speak to you as you read through his word, as you go throughout your day, ask him to do that. Second of all, I will give God what I cannot do. I will give God what I cannot do. Here's what it says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Jesus Christ. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. That's 1 Peter 5.1. So it reminds me of, if you've ever been through any 12-step or have known somebody who's gone through the 12 steps, there's this prayer. It's called the serenity prayer. I love that prayer. I think it's a good prayer. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's pretty much one and two that I just outlined. Do what you know you need to do. Ask God to reveal it to you and then do it. And then when you can't do it, give it to God. We must discern what we cannot do. Can you cure cancer? No, you cannot. So give that to God. Worrying about it is not going to add a day to the person's life you're worried about or yours. So can you change your adult child's mind on anything? No. So stop worrying about it. Take it to God as prayers and petitions and lay it down. Trust him with it. So do the things you need to do and then let go of the things you cannot do. When we worry about these things, we are lacking faith that God can handle it. Sometimes we want to give God a little bit of help, don't we? He doesn't need our help. He needs our obedience. So no matter what the outcome we trust God. So, to overcome the stranglehold of worry, the number one thing was, I will do what God asked me to do. The second thing was, I will give God what I cannot do. And the third one I want to reiterate today or talk about today is, no matter what happens, I will trust God. No matter what happens, I will trust God. Matthew 6, 33 and 34 says this, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Or some translations say, tomorrow has enough worries on its own. You don't need to add more to it. So, do we really trust God? Or do we think he needs our help? This other verse I've shared with you guys many times here. It's one of my favorite verses. It's one that anybody, if you haven't committed to memory, you should commit it to memory. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, I've said this many times as I've come in here. A straight path does not mean an easy path. God does not promise you an easy life. Many times that verse has been misconstrued and really used inappropriately to say, well, if you just trust God, life will go easy. Life will be good. I'll tell you this. If you trust God and you trust in him and everything about your life, you will have your best life possible. But he tells us in this world you will have struggles. So it does not mean that a straight path is an easy path. So do not hear me saying that. Straight does not equal easy. But the opposite of worry is faith. 
And faith is believing God can do fill in the blank, even if he chooses not to. If you have that loved one that's suffering from cancer, God can heal that person. But he may choose not to. And you have to trust him no matter what. And the reason we trust God is because he's trustworthy. It's really that simple. Why do we trust God? Because he's worthy of it. He's never let us down. He's never failed us. You may say, oh, but pastor, I've been through some tough stuff, and where was God? The answer was, he was there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So the first thing you need to know from that scripture is, though I walk through. He's going to see you through it. He doesn't say, yay, though I walk into the valley and stay there forever. That is not how the scripture goes. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, the shadow of death. And here's the next part. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If he's the good shepherd, rod and staff is what he uses to lead. So he led you there. You didn't just fall into this problem. He wants to teach you something. He wants to expand you. He wants to help you. He will not abandon you. He is with you. Your path is straight, but that path may be down a deep ravine. Or that, may be, that path may be up a steep incline. People pay money to go climb big, steep inclines, right? But sometimes we as Christians, we're afraid of them because it's too hard. You can trust God no matter what. He's always with you. So I believe these three statements are the key to us overcoming the stranglehold of worry in our lives. If we can say, I will do what God asked me to do, I will give God what I cannot do, and no matter what happens, I will trust God. If you can do that, slowly but surely the worry will start coming off of you and your life. And the stranglehold and the choking out of your life will, will lessen. And you will live your best life. If you can just do those three, three things. So John's going to come back up and he's going to lead us uh, in our final song. But there's a couple of things I just want you to think about. There's two types of people here today, right? There are listening online. There's people that are Christians, but they're holding on to worry. They've got a pretty good tight grip of worry. They think God needs their help. And then there are those who haven't begun a relationship with God. And they're holding on to control, too. They think, but if I become a Christian, I'll never have any fun. But if I become a Christian, what will happen to my family and my friends that aren't believers? I need to control the situation. Either way, Christians, we want to control, and non-Christians, they want to control. But the Lord says, no, I need to be Lord of your life. So either way, Whichever group you're in, either you haven't begun a relationship with God or you have a relationship with God, at some level, we all need to let go of something. Whether it's control of our eternal life because we think we have it under control and God's saying no. See, if you aren't a believer already, we talk about it really around here very easily. It's A, B, C. You admit you made mistakes. That's called sin. In fact, worry is a sin. So you worrying about life all the time is a sin. And the problem is the cost or the wage of sin is death. And so Jesus came and he came as our substitute so we didn't have to die to pay our sin debt. And that's the B. You believe that Jesus died as your substitute. You admit you made mistakes. You believe that Jesus died as your substitute. And then you just choose. You choose to make him the Lord of your life. You choose to say, I'm going to trust you no matter what. And some of you that are Christians, you did that at one point in time. You said, I trust you, God. But then you kind of pulled a little bit of it back. Yeah, but I can do this, God. I got it. And he said, no, I need you to trust me. So either way, we got to let go. Let go of the sin of worry in our lives. And so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to just lead us in a prayer. But as we do that, if you'll just put yourself in a bit of a vulnerable position. I just want to take your hands, palms up, fists clenched. And just on the count of three, I want you to open them up as wide as you can. One, two, three. That's a vulnerable position. 
It's a position to receive. And so Ben started us off earlier with a prayer, and he said, we just ask that we would be able to receive what it is you have for us to hear today. I hope today you've heard, let go. Let go. So let's just pray. So just close your eyes, bow your head where you are. Keep your hands open if you would. Father, I just ask right now that those that have worried about their kids, about their parents, about themselves, about their finances, about their lives, Lord, I just pray that they would let go. And Lord, just as our arms are open and our hands are open, just like you would as you're coming up to somebody, you want to give them a hug, we ask that you would do that right now. You are Abba, Father, Daddy, and we need you. You're with us. But Lord, I pray you'd make yourself real, tangible. Move in their heart and their mind right now that they would sense your presence. And those that don't know you, don't have a relationship with you, I pray right now they would have this amazing tug from your Holy Spirit that you are calling them and drawing them to you and saying, I got you. I've got your back. Don't worry. I paid it all. I paid your debt from the past, I paid your debt from today, and I paid your debt for the future. You can trust me with your sukkah. Our whole life, our past, our present, our future, our emotions, our spiritual life, our physical life, we trust you. So whether that's your first time to say that, and you say, I admit I've made mistakes, Lord, I believe you died on the cross, and I'm choosing to trust you today, then today's your day of salvation. If you're doing that online, I pray that somehow you'd reach out to us in the chat or somehow and let us know. If you're here today and that's your first time, please don't leave without telling somebody. But if you are a believer and you're just saying, I am recommitting my life to living with hands open, embracing God and trusting Him, I just pray you'd make that commitment to Him right now. So Lord, we love you. We trust you. Help us to do what we are called to do by your word. Help us to admit the things we cannot do and trust you with them. And so, Lord, give us the wisdom today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children Miss Faber be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children Miss Faber be upon you and a thousand generations and your family, your children, and their children, and their children, and his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you, he is with you, he is with you, in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, Rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you have the ability and you want to set us free from these things in life that hold us hostage. Lord, help us to let go of worry. Help us to do what it is you've called us to do. Help us to know what we cannot do and help us to trust you in all of these things because you are trustworthy. And Lord, I pray your blessing, just as we just sang, over each person here. Go with them, give them peace, give them strength, and give them wisdom as they go where they live, work, and play, and help them to be a light in a dark world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all are welcome to stay and chat with Ben and Susie. Ask any questions. Don't forget to pick up one of the cards on your way out. And we'll see you next week as we deal with one more issue that holds us hostage in life and how to break free. See you next week.